much faith. You know what you love when the devil tries to mess stuff up and we don't let him? Amen. And don't you love, too, how God, faith had zero idea on what I was preaching on today. And then she sings this, and it's basically what I'm preaching on today. And um, just being a light and um, being the salt in a, in a dark, dark world. Um, as, as we think about the times that we live in, as we think about how short life is, and as I talked about the second coming of Christ last week, we know that the rapture of the church is imminent. It can happen at any moment. And as I said last week, it's time for the church to get busy. And I can't think of any area that we need to get busier in doing in sharing Christ, being a witness, being a testimony. How many of you have ever heard somebody say, I can vouch for that? Some of you. Not everybody knows what you've never heard, I can vouch for that? All right. And, and again, that's the title of my sermon today is, I can vouch for that. And and again, when you think about the word vouch, it means to supply supporting evidence or a testimony, to give a personal assurance. In other words, when you say, I can vouch for that, you're saying that you are a witness. And, and a witness, when we talk about a witness, is, is a, a witness is somebody who has personal knowledge of something that has happened. Now, how many of you are saved today? That was 12. Listen, if you're saved today, you know what? You have personal knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done for you. you. You have a personal story. You have a personal testimony. You have personal knowledge in, of, of what Christ has done for you. And you can say, I can vouch for that. How many of you have ever heard of Ed Kimball? Anybody know who Ed Kimball is? I was expecting that response. Ed Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. Ed Kimball was talking to a young man one day and led him to Christ. That young man was D.L. Moody. Anybody know who D.L. Moody is? We all know who D.L. Moody is, right? So D.L. Moody gets saved. D.L. Moody is evangelizing America. And then D.L. Moody decides that he wants to start evangelizing England. He comes to England, and he meets up with F.B. Meyer. How many of you are familiar with F.B. Meyer? Some of you know who F.B. Meyer is. F.B. Meyer hears D.L. Moody preach, and again, D.L. Moody uses an illustration in his sermon. F.B. Meyer didn't quite understand or didn't quite grasp the illustration. But a man from the church comes up to F.B. Meyer, and he talks about this change that this illustration that D.L. Moody had used in his sermon had just impacted and touched the life of this little girl and all they did, he said, he said, he said Mr. Mr. Meyer, I want you to know this. In our Sunday school class today, the presence and power and spirit of God met with us in the Sunday school class over the fact that this illustration that D.L. Moody had used in his sermon had touched the life of this little girl, and they couldn't, couldn't, quit, couldn't, quit, couldn't quit talking about it. Now, F.B. Meyer, if, and again, talking about F.B. Meyer, he was so affected by the testimony and those girls that he got off by himself and began to grip him in the same manner. So again, F.B. Meyer's ministry began to open up and spread, and then it did. He, he was invited to come to America. So F.B. Meyer comes to Furman University to preach. There was a young person in the student body that day that was going to quit ministry and decided he was going to go on to a secular job. You want to know who that man was? R.G. Lee. Who knows R.G. Lee? Another great preacher. You see where I'm going with this? R.G. Lee. R.G. Lee made, made great impact, preached the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. F.B. Meyer went on to preach at another location. In that service, a young fellow caught fire and began to evangelize. His meetings spread all over the world in, in New England, the Mid Atlantic coast, until they were, again, the churches were over, I mean, they were bulging at the seams. There was a man there named J. Wilbur Chapman. He was so set on fire of God through the preaching of F.B. Meyer, he began to stir up. And again, the whole northeastern coast was never the same because of the preaching of the gospel. Then because of Chapman's preaching, he was, he was invited to speak at a certain place. His ministry was changing. He needed someone to move on to the citywide crusades that somebody else was holding. Someone said, the man you want, the man you want is this young convert, Billy Sunday. 
Anybody know Billy Sunday? All right, we're getting there. Doesn't stop there, though, guys. Billy Sunday was influenced by J. Wilbur Chapman to go into ministry. He goes to Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> Y'all know the next name I'm about to mention, aren't don't you? There's a group of laymen that got so inspired and so stirred up, they organized this committee to invite other evangelists to come back. One was invited, it was Mordecai Ham from Louisville, Kentucky. See, there is good in Kentucky. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He preached in the, me in the meeting. Guess who got saved in the meeting? <laughs> Billy Graham. Anybody know who Billy Graham is? <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Now listen to me, guys. I say all that to say this. All of this started because of a Sunday school teacher. Not because of some great theologian, not because of somebody who had all this education, not because of, some, guys, it started because a Sunday school teacher had such a burning desire and a passion to share Jesus that somebody else in their class got saved. And guys, again, it started in a domino effect. And of all those men that I just mentioned, how many millions of lives do you think have been impacted by those men's preaching? Every one of us have a candle, right? Every one of us, if you are saved today, you have been changed by the glorious gospel. And church, what I want to convey to us today is this, guys. It is again, when we talk about, and again, the church is always looking for new methods and new ways and this, that, and the other. Guys, can I say this about witnessing? We don't need new methods. You know what we need? We need a passion. We need something to ignite the church to understand the importance of witnessing. And so I'm here today to bring that spark. All right? Now, and this week, we, you know, um, we have a tradition. Every time we take our kids to the doctor, we always stop and, you know, get them a happy meal or something. And it used to be good when they were younger. Happy Meals are a lot cheaper than the value meals. There's no value in those meals, financially or physically. So, you know, Micah, or not Micah, Luke, this week, we've had them all at the doctor this week, it seems like, including me. I got a good report, by the way. They said I was healthy. My doctor even said there's a brain there. <laughs> she did, she said that to me. <laughs> She said that to me, didn't she? So, of course, I'm asking, I'm like, is it r the right size? I mean, I just, you know, this, that, and the other. So, um, she did. She said, there's a brain. She said, everything's good. She said, just quit being stressed and anxious. And I'm like, well, that won't happen until Jesus comes back. I still have seven kids, and I still pastor church, so none of that's changed. And so, that's always going to be part of it. But, again, taking Luke to, to and, and we're, we're at Wendy's, and we were, no, it was Micah. I'm sorry, it was Micah. And then... Because we because we had McKenna at urgent care. Like I said, guys, when you have this many kids, you, you get messed up sometimes. And so we're at Wendy's, and or, made the order for for McKenna. And Micah said, "Dad, you have tracks." I'm like, "Yeah." And we're at the drive-through, so guess what? You got two chances, right? You got where you pay, and then where you pick up. And so each one of them got a track. Again, guys, I don't say that to boast and to brag. I say that, guys, because, again, to, un to get us to understand the importance of every single opportunity that we get to share the gospel. Again, when you're at the drive through window, you don't, sit, you don't have time to sit there and go through Romans Road and, and go through all this. But you know what? They can take time reading through a track that's got the same thing that you were about to, that you're going to tell them. And you just pray and hope that they take time to read it. Guys, I've said this before, and, and, and it bears repeating again. How many of you receive junk mail? How many of you receive envelopes that have the return envelope? The re, they give you a stamp, the return, a survey or whatever back. Throw a track in there. How many still pay your bills by mail? Put a track in them. I promise you they will not quit sending you bills. You pay your Duke Energy by mail, guess what? You can mark it down, Duke Energy, sending it back to you next month. Throw another track in. Until they quit sending you bills. 
which will never happen. And, and by the way, guys, the same people don't open those up every single month. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. And, and here's, here's the, guys, here's the reality. You don't have to be Pastor Tim to share Jesus. You don't have to be Kyle McQuinn with, with, with seminary degrees. Guys, we don't, you don't need that to share Christ. You know what you need? You need to be a witness. You need to have a testimony. You need to have a story. If you're saved today, guess what? You have all those. Which brings me to John chapter 1. So if you have, if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, look at verse number 29 with me. The Bible says, The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, excuse me, am I coming baptizing with water? John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and abode unto him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Unto whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he that which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare record that this is who? The Son of God. Now, that's the message. Look at, look at verse number 40 with me. Or actually, let, let me just keep reading. And again, the next day, after John stood, two of his disciples, looking upon Jesus as he walked, and again, so the first time he's talking about Jesus, Jesus is coming towards him, right? And he says, look, look who's coming. Now we're seeing as, as Jesus is walking, John still makes the same proclamation, gives, us, gives the same message. Again, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, are, and guys, this is what's so good. They heard him speak, and they did what? They followed him. Guys, you need to understand this morning, there is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But again, it, it has lost its power if we never preach it. I brought you an illustration today, to hopefully to get all of us to understand it. Here's a bag of seeds. These are my wife's. She doesn't know I took them off the back porch. I can't even, she knows now. I wasn't counting on her being here today. <laughs> What's the name of that flower? Coleus. Coleus. Beautiful flower. But guys, what good are these seeds if they stay in the package? So picture this, guys. The seeds are the gospel, and the package is us. What good is the gospel if it stays inside the package, which is us? Right? Now, I've also brought you something else. I had to go dig this myself this morning because none of the kids would. It's dirt. What's the first thing you should do with seed? Put it in some, some soil, right? Again, this is, the, this is the whole part of sowing. And again, sowing seed, guys. The Sunday school teacher, Ed Kimball, you know what he did? Sowed seed. Kept sowing the gospel. Kept sowing seed. Kept sowing seed. Kept sowing seed. And as a result of him, the Sunday school teacher, Ed Kimball, who, by the way, none of you raised your hand and knew about, but you know Ed Kimball now, don't you? Because of Ed Kimball, countless millions of people have been impacted. Because he took time to not keep the gospel in his package, in his temple, but he said, you know what, listen, I'm going to be a light. I'm going to take every opportunity that God gives me to share the glorious gospel. And you know why Ed Kimball did that? Because his life was changed by the gospel. And he said, you know what, anytime I can sow some seed, I'm doing it. Paul said it like this, some sow, right, some water, but it's God that gives, the, that gives the increase. Now, what do you think will happen with this seed if I put it in this dirt? 
Well, Veronica's not going to like you because she had plans for those. I can't even get it open. Right? That's probably too many, but you're going to come back next week. This thing will be all over the, <laughs> which is good, though, right? Now, so what's the next thing we need to do? Is, 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 that going to is that going to live if we don't do anything else? No. Now it's time to water. And this is where, again, we all come and play a part, guys. Listen, not everybody that you tell the first time about Jesus is going to give their life to Christ. It may, me, it may take me telling somebody and then Mark Blair coming behind me and throwing some water on it. But here's the beauty of it, guys. If we keep doing, listen, and by, and by the way, if you only get one out of a hundred people converted, guess what? It's worth it. Listen, Jesus left the 99 to go after the one. And so guess what? I just threw this whole bag of seed in there. And if next week only one of them shows up, guess what? It's worth it because it is going to be absolutely beautiful. And guess what? Ed Kimball led D.L. Moody to Christ. And I promise you, he, he had told many countless other people about Jesus. But D.L. Moody gave his life to Jesus. And because of D.L. Moody, guys, we have seen a beautiful thing happen because of millions of others have come to know Christ. But guys, again, we have to do something. And guys, there's so many ways, and we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, that, that we can sow seed. But the story doesn't stop there, because we keep reading. And guys, here, this, this is what my, my, my favorite part of the whole story. And Jesus turned, and he saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard who speak? Now, guys, that's important to understand. He heard John speak. And what did John speak? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You know why he said that, guys? And again, they were, and I, I believe there was time, there was, at this particular time, they were on their way to the temple, bringing the sacrifice, and what did they bring for sacrifice? Lambs. And you know what he, you know what John is telling them? Listen, you can bring all the lambs you want. You can bring, you, you can bring countless hundreds of lambs to the slaughter and to the sacrifice, but guess what? There won't be a single one of those lambs that will take away your sin. But guess what? The one who was, we've been talking about, the ones that the prophets had talked about for countless hundreds of years, guess what? He's here. And behold him. Look at him. He's here to take away the sin of the world. And church, what the, the message that the world needs to hear today is that, you know what, listen, there is somebody that can take away your sin, and his name is Jesus. Amen. There is somebody who was the sacrifice, who paid the debt that you rightfully deserve. And we keep reading. And then one of the two, he said, and he followed him, was who? Andrew. And I love how the Holy Spirit said, not only was he Andrew, but he was Simon Peter's brother. Now, one more place, real quick. Go over to Luke. Luke chapter number 19. And guys, this is, this is part of what, what I want us to get today. Guys, I love my community. I love the city of Trenton. I love everything that, is, that it's about. It, it's, it's small town America. You know, again, we had the opportunity to read publicly the word of God. And guys, there's so much, again, that, that, that God has allowed us. But Trenton is, is the same as any other city. There are so many lost people in Trenton. There are so many people who are unsaved. And another part of what I want to try to convey to us today is Luke 19, verse 41. And when he was come near, 
referring to Jesus, he beheld the city and wept over it. Church, every, every, everybody up here, seriously. When's the last time we've wept over Trenton? When's the last time we've become so passionate and compassionate about the gospel that we have wept? By the way, guys, this was Jesus weeping. He wept. And why did he weep? Dude, let's keep reading. If thou hadst known, even thou at least in thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Here's why he's weeping. He's weeping because, again, they had heard the way of peace, but what? Rejected it. And as a result of them rejecting the way of peace, utter destruction was about to happen on Jerusalem. And guys, it should break the heart of every single child of God that there is a world out there who is lost, dying, and going to hell, separated from a holy God. If we don't do anything about it. Whether it's passing out a track, whether it's sharing, whether it's inviting them to church, whether it's just weeping and praying. But guys, when's the last time the church, when's the last time we have wept personally over a loved one? And guys, I promise you, if I asked you today, how many of you have at least one brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uncle who doesn't know Jesus, every hand in this building would go up today. But then if I would ask you the next question, how many times have you witnessed to that person? How many hands would still stay up? And you know what, guys? I, I've, heard, I've heard all the reasons. Well, Pastor, I, I, I'm not courageous enough. I'm not, I don't know how to do it. I don't. Guys, again, th th that's Satan convincing you not to do it. You know what I believe Andrew did? He just shared with Peter what, what Jesus had just done for him. Listen, he didn't have Romans Road. He didn't go to Simon Peter and say, oh, well, you know, Romans 3.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. He didn't say, Peter, now, now, now turn over to Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Hey, Peter, let me, turn, let me show you Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were just sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, Peter, wait, I got a couple more verses. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes it. Guys, he didn't have all that. But you know what he did have? He had a testimony. He had a story. He could say, I can vouch for that. Because, listen, I know what Jesus has done for me. And when he says that he followed him, guys, he was making a lifelong commitment to follow Jesus. That Jesus says, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come unto thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. One more quick question. How many, honestly, believe the rapture can happen today okay yeah. now we believe that right ask somebody right now ask God put somebody on your heart personally to share Christ with because I want us all to think about something today what if the rapture happened Who do we have on our list that we've not told about Jesus? Wife, husband, child, grandchild, neighbor, best friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, classmate, school teacher. Guys, again, this, this Christian, this guy's, this is serious business. It really is. 
Because, guys, we're talking about eternity. We're not talking about a week, two weeks, three weeks, five weeks, ten weeks. We're not, talk, we're not even talking about ten years, guys. We are talking about forever. And again, how would we feel, guys, if, if, if again, and, and let me just encourage you with this. You do your part and allow God to do his part. If you tell them about Jesus and they reject him, that's not on you. Yes, you still weep and you still grieve over him. But you know what you've done? You've put the seed in the soil. Now you allow Mark Blair to come by and water it. That is funny. I use Mark Blair because he, he loves gardening. <laughs> you were the first one to come to my mind, brother. So two things, just, just two thoughts I want to share about witnessing this morning. Number one, make, make, make witnessing a priority. Now go back to John chapter 1. Make it a priority. Now, verse 41. If you write in your Bible, let me, let me read verse 40 again. One of the two which heard John speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And then verse 41, he says, he what? What's the very next word he says? First. First. And who was Simon Peter in relation to Andrew? His brother. Guys, you know what that tells me? When you give your life to Jesus, the very first people that you should search out to tell about Jesus is your family. And again, I truly believe this, guys. Because family it should be the most important people in our lives, it should be the first people that we tell about eternity. And, and again, I love when he, he, when he goes to Simon Peter, he, he, he says unto him, we have found... We have found the Messiah. Listen, his, his witnessing to his brother was a priority. Listen, I love the fact that he wasn't focused on Jesus' miracles. He wasn't focused on Jesus' teachings. He wasn't focused on anything about that. He was focused on the fact that, you know what? We have found the Messiah. We have found the Savior. We have found Jesus. And he just changed my life. And guess what? He can change your life, Peter. It was a priority. And guys, again, what should be a priority to a child of God? And again, anybody who is, a, again, who is so in love in G, with Jesus and has a passion for the things of God should have no problem being a witness. And then I'll hear people say, well, Pastor, I've only been saved a week. How can I be a witness? Has Jesus changed your life? Yes. Then you just tell them what Jesus did to you. Well, I don't know any Bible verses. That, that's okay, neither do I. And I've got a degree I can put on my wall. <laughs> that's what my wife does, too, when I say that. <laughs> but guys, witness should be a priority to us. Guys, anything that deals with God should be a priority. You know what makes a good witness? Write these down. Here's what makes a good witness. Number one, you're credible. Now again, this is what I mean. Is, is people say, well, I've only been saved for a week. I can't, I can't do this. You're, they're trustworthy. They're, they're, they're credible. The second thing about a good witness is this, guys, is they, they know something. Now, again, if, if you've seen a crime or you've, if you've seen an accident or you've seen something, guess what? You, number one, you're credible because you've seen it and you know something because, again, you were there and you know what happened, right? And then you, know you want to know the best part about being a good witness? Is not only are they credible and they know something, but they say something. Guys, how many times have you watched television and someone will come out and say they witnessed something, but they won't tell what they witnessed? There's no credibility there, guys. <laughs> Do you think John was a good witness? You think he was credible? Yeah. Do you think he knew something? Yeah, he knew the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. 
And you know what, guys? He couldn't contain himself. Listen, what I know, I have to talk about. <laughs> Listen, I know, I, I know that the Messiah is here. I know that the Lamb of God that we've been talking about for centuries is here. I know why he's here to take away the sin in the world, and I can't keep my mouth shut. And child of God, listen to me this morning. If you have been chained by the power of Jesus Christ, you should not be able to contain and keep your mouth shut. Because we know what we were like before Jesus, and we know what we're like because of Jesus. Say something. Well, Pastor, I'd much rather just live it around them. And that's good. You should. But you know what? Eventually, you're going to have to open your mouth. I personally, and again, maybe, maybe I'm wrong with this, but I've never seen or heard somebody say, well, I gave their life to Jesus because I watched their life. Now, I've heard them say, I've watched their life, and then I started asking questions. And then as a result of that, somebody spoke up and started sharing the gospel. And by the way, there's not too many of us that could live a perfect life to where people would want to get saved because of our lives, right? Well, guys, making it a priority. I mean, we do that with everything else, don't we? Now, and I'm not trying to make anybody mad. Well, yeah, I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> the Avengers movie, right? Man, people made that a priority. Is there anything wrong with the Avengers? Again, I, I, I've never seen it, so I, I, I'm not saying there's any. Listen. But people made it a priority. Why? Because it's important to them. Right? Which brings me to number two about witnessing. Is we need to get a passion for witnessing again. Guys, you know what I loved about Andrew? He couldn't wait to tell his brother. You, you can almost see and sense the excitement in his, in, in his, in his, in his words in verse 41. You can almost sense it. He said, listen, we have found the Messiah. He didn't just come and say, hey, Peter, guess what? We found this Messiah guy they've been talking about for a long time. No. <laughs> Do you remember when you gave your life? Did you, anybody remember when you got saved? Were you excited or did you say, eh, eh, just another day? No. You were excited. Why? Because there was a life change that occurred in your life. Guys, I've told you this story more. And guys, I am not, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I was, tell, I was talking to dogs and cats. Listen, I didn't care who it was. I wanted to tell anything that moved about Jesus. Baptized a couple cats. They didn't come up too well. But that's all right. They're in kitty heaven or whatever they have for them in purgatory. <laughs> all you cat lovers, I love you. That's all I'm going to say about that. But, but again, being passionate about it. And again, Andrew knew that, that, that Peter was lost. He knew that his brother didn't know who Jesus, he didn't know Jesus. And guys, that was unsettling to him. Guys, you, you, know, what, you know what passion is, guys? It's just this, this, this burning desire, this, this, this inner compulsion that, that causes you to action, that moves you to do something. And guys, you know what breaks my heart about the church today? Is that, again, we become passionate about so many things. And, and, and guys, again, I am, I am not telling you not to be passionate about stuff. Because your pastor is passionate about stuff. But guys, when we've lost our passion for the gospel, when we've lost our passion for the things of God, it should cause us to stop and examine ourselves. Guys, when you, when you, when you read about the disciples and how they forsook all and followed him, guys, you know what they did? They forsook all and followed him. I'm not saying we quit our job. Guys, again, I'm not, I'm not saying all that. But I'm saying we should use our workplaces as a place to share the gospel. Andrew was passionate. 
Guys, how many know Michael Jordan? Not the offensive lineman the Bengals just drafted. Guys, do you know what drove Michael Jordan to be the greatest basketball player to ever live? His passion for the game. His passion to be the best. He, he had a burning desire in him, guys, to do what? To do something. The best basketball player to ever, ever live. How many of you guys know Pete Rose? Well, that might not be a good. But anyways, that, that's a good example. I love Pete Rose. He's got, he's got the baseball record that will never be broken. And you can argue with me all day, but that record will never be broken. But you know what drove him to be a great hitter? His passion for baseball. Right? How many of y'all know Tim Smith? <laughs> you know what drives him to be the greatest preacher who's ever lived? <laughs> Not this Tim Smith. I'm talking about somebody else. No. <laughs> and I say that in jokingly, but guys, listen. You know what drives me to do this, guys? It's just the passion that I have for Christ and knowing what he's done for me. Guys, John Knox, that great Scotland, Scottish missionary, you know what he said? He cried out and begged, begged God, give me Scotland, Scotland or I die. You know what drove him to that? Passion. Billy Sunday, you know what? He, he cried out to God and said, God, make me a giant for God. You know what drove him to do that? His passion for God. And Billy Sunday was a drunk. How many believe God is still saving drunks? I know personally, because I am one. Or not, I'm not one. I used to be. <laughs> oh, Lord, forgive me. For I know not what I say. I was one. That's what I think you're drinking right now. But passion, guys, that's, that's, what, that's what drives us to do anything that we love. Is again, it's a, it's a burning desire. And guys, again, how great, how much greater would our communities be, our marriages be, our, our, our homes, our children, and, and, and teenagers, I'm talking to you guys too. How much different would our schools look if we had a, a, a generation of teenagers that just decided, you know what, I'm just going to have a passion for the things of God. I don't care if it's cool with the other kids. I don't care if, listen, they talk about me and mock me. Because they'll do that. But again, Andrew, you saw his passion. And again, you saw the fact that, again, he wanted his brother to know who Jesus was. And church, can I just say this to you too? It only takes a small spark. There's a song out, it only takes a spark to light the whole blaze. It only takes a little flame. Guys, you know what it's going to take? Just a small spark. I promise you, if, if next Sunday somebody came up here and said, hey, hey church, I got, I got a story I want to tell you. I started witnessing to my daughter, my son, my husband, my wife. They gave their life to Jesus this week. The roof would come off this place, Amen. That was convincing. <laughs> right? And then you know what would happen, guys? It would become contagious. I want to be able to share a story like that in front of church. I want to be able to tell my church family, that, you know what, listen, my husband got saved, my wife got saved, my, my neighbor got saved, my, my grandchild got saved, my son. Listen, guys, it would, start, it, would, it would start a whole new revolution. And guys, we are living in a day, guys, where everybody has a rally. You know what the church needs? A bringing people to Jesus rally. Start a rally. Get passionate about something. Not just something. Get passionate about telling people about Jesus. How many of y'all like this song, What a Beautiful Name? Okay, keep your hand up just for a minute. If you like that song, keep your, name, keep your hand up. Now, let me ask you this. 
How many believe that song? It's a beautiful name. It's a wonderful name. It's a powerful name. Right? You know who doesn't believe it? The world. And you know why? Because we're not telling them about this wonderful name, this beautiful name, this powerful name. Because instead of being passionate about we're looking for new methods and new ways, and, and guys, again, there are some things that the church doesn't need to fix. And you know what we could never fix? The gospel. You know what you can never make better? The gospel. You know what you can never make better? The truth of the word of God. You can't add to or take away from this. And that's what they need to hear. Because there's a story told of two men that they traveled to India a lot. One was a sportsman, one was a missionary. For 25 years they had done this. And they were coming home one day and, and the sportsman made this, this statement. He said, uh, 25 years I've been in India and I have never seen one person converted to Christianity. And so the missionary says, well, sir, can I ask you something? Have you ever seen a tiger? Of course, the sportsman speaks up. Yes, hundreds of them. Shot dozens of them. And he said, well, that's great that you've seen that, sir. He said, but you know what I've seen? I've been here 25 years. I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people come to know Jesus as their Savior. See, guys, again, when you, when you think about how we look at things because what was the sportsman's eye on a tiger what was the missionary's eye on souls big difference he didn't see all the converts because why because he was focused on what he was passionate about and the missionary saw not a single tiger and that's what he told him. He said, listen, I've been here 25 years. I've never seen a single tiger. But here's what I have seen. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new converts. But guys, here's what happens in the church. I want to say it without you all start singing a song. You guys got your eye, I don't want to say eye of the tiger, eye on the tiger. You see, everybody's like, he's got the eye of the tiger. No. <laughs> Instead of having our eyes on people that need Jesus. Is there anything wrong with tigers? No. But guys, is there anything wrong with the Avengers movie? Is there anything wrong with basketball? Is there anything wrong with baseball? Guys, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But when we get more passionate about those things than we do about the things of God, we've lost the importance of what passion should be. We were up there reading this Friday night, and, and you know, you're always going to get people that drive by and mock you. And, you know, we had people honking and, and waving and just, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and of course, we had a couple people drive by, rev their engines up real loud, and I'm like, cool man because that really distracted me from reading the word I, you know it's it really distracting a couple of people yelled out at us and mocked us and again my flesh wanted to respond back and yell back at them but you know what it made me think they need Christ they wouldn't be doing that if they knew my savior they wouldn't be driving by a bible reading marathon and hollering and cussing out at us if they knew my Jesus. And then here was another thought, guys, that really convicted me. I wonder if anybody's even told them about our Jesus. Guys, you don't have to be a D.L. Moody. You can be an Ed Kimball. And if you want to be an Ed Kimball, guess what? You never know if the next Billy Graham is that young man that you're talking to. 
You never know if that young man that you're witnessing to is the next D.L. Moody or Fanny Crosby or Lottie Moon or Annie Armstrong. Guys, the question we need to ask ourselves is, where's our passion? One more story I want to tell you, and this is, I thought this was just the coolest story I read, is Charles Spurgeon. How many of y'all know Charles Spurgeon? Charles Spurgeon's one of my heroes. Matter of fact, we named Luke Charles Haddon Isaac Smith. <laughs> yeah, we, we had one name picked for him, and then one of our kids was like, no, how about, and so we said, we're going to name so don't make fun of Luke because he's got 17 names. But Charles Spurgeon was in Agricultural Hall in, in England, and he, he, he was there, and he was testing the acoustics of, of the hall. And so here's what he says. He's in this hall by himself, and all of a sudden he just yells out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, just so he can check the acoustics. Had no idea that there was a man in the rafters. That man gave his life to Christ. And all he heard was Charles Spurgeon cry out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Guys, witnessing is that simple. You don't have to know everything. You don't, you don't have to know all the scriptures. You don't know, guys, you don't have to. You just have to know what Jesus has done for you. How many sinners in here today? Let's start there. Right? We're all sinners. How many believe there's a penalty for sin? You break the law, guess what? There's punishment. Rightfully so. How many of you have ever had something paid for you? You've ever had a dinner, lunch? You've had something that, that was paid for you? How'd that make you feel? <laughs> As a pastor, I love when people buy my food. <laughs> you see how it makes you feel, right? And then you start thinking about, I'm a sinner. There's a penalty for sin. But somebody paid it for me. Right? And not just somebody or anybody, Jesus. How many believe Jesus died on the cross? Okay. Why did he do that? That was the way to pay for the punishment for my sin. That was the way to pay for sin, sin's debt. And how many of you have believed that Jesus rose from the dead? There you go. Now you're a witness. Because you know what? You're credible. Right? Now you all know something. Now you know what you need to do? Say something. Guys, here's our challenge. God's put somebody on your heart today to share the gospel. Your challenge is to do this. Share the gospel with that person this week. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them what God's done in your life. Be like Andrew. Andrew followed Jesus, and after, as he gave his life to Christ, he couldn't wait to tell somebody. Be Ed Kimball this week. Now some of you are all going to go home and Google Ed Kimball, aren't you? And you should, guys. He's, he's a fascinating man. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Maybe you're here today. And guys, I've, I've done this before. We still have the evidence of it over here. I don't know, three, four, five months ago. You guys remember this sermon? The coal. What was the purpose of the coal? When your fire starts to go out, what do you need to do? Throw some more coal on the fire. Reignite it. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe your flame has been distinguished. 
Extinguished, not distinguished. <laughs> None of y'all caught that, though. And you know what? That's what Satan loves to do, guys. He loves to quench the fire that burns, it, that burns in us. He loves it. He knows he can't get our soul. We, we are eternally saved. But man, he can make our lives miserable. He can make us ineffective for the kingdom. And he's doing an awfully good job at it. I've, I've shared this with many people in our church, and I've shared it with my wife. And, and guys, it breaks your pastor's heart that we haven't baptized. We've only baptized three people this year. Now, again, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to focus on numbers. Don't, don't get me, don't get us on numbers. But it breaks my heart, guys, because you know what? I love, again, when I read the book of Acts, they added to the church daily. How awesome would it be, guys, if we saw people every single day giving their life to Jesus? Well, Pastor, I've shared, listen, keep sharing. Well, Pastor, I've shared, listen, I've heard stories of missionaries, guys, that have been over in China and Japan and, and other parts of the world that have been there 10, 12 years and not had a single convert. But you know what they kept doing? They kept preaching Jesus. I promise you this, guys. I'm done. Praise team, make your way up. I promise you, when Ed Kimball was teaching that Sunday school class, he had zero idea the impact D.L. Moody was going to make. 